Ladies and gentlemen, the second part is soon starting. Please take your places, regain your seats, fasten your seat belts, and we're now going to move into something which is very, very, very close to and concerns us a lot at the Stockholm School of Economics, and I imagine here too. Uh, but we're moving into an area which in Swedish is called the philosophy of Sifernissar. <laughs> and how come, how come we love figures, data, zeros and ones, etc. And from there on we'll branch off uh, in, 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 in very interesting interesting reflections. Because now we have the honor of introducing you, Brian. Brian has been visiting us several times, at least two times. Uh, he came for uh, the Goldin Sandebu show at the uh, Tensta Konsthal. And uh, you are actually contributing a chapter to a book we put together on the Goldin Sandebu work. Uh, and uh, your chapter is a fantastic, very interesting one. And we were sort of blown, mind blowing when we read it first. So, we're very, very happy that you, you could come. Although you got problems with Norwegian, but we won't speak about <laughs> that. <laughs> but the floor is yours, Brian. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks so much, Pierre. And um, yeah, I should also extend uh, a real thanks to, to, to you and, and uh, to, to Isaac and Eric at the Stockholm School of Economics for, for also having me. And, and Simon and Jakob Golden Senebi as well, Marie Lynn for, for also kind of putting up for a very rudimentary and early version of, of many of these thoughts um, last year at at, at Um Yeah, it's a real honor to 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 share the the, the stage and the day with with Exceli and the Economic Space Agency um, because I. They they have such a such a, a bold um, approach to to so to so many aspects of financialization, which have become I think it's also clear to the audience from the questions now, which have become so problematic um, over the years, and and it's really inspiring at a time when when many other things, as Exeli was saying about about the 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 production of subjectivity, where where it's very hard to find. Um, um, forward thinking and, and 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 inspiring ways of intervening in the functioning of the of of the world and its and its mechanisms on a very uh, large uh, level. Um, I I I sometimes feel um, quite uh, held back uh, or less bold because because uh, you know <laughs> you know that we we have seen so so many catastrophes in the in the financial world in. Um, uh, in, 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 the, in the understanding even of ourselves as, uh, and, and our own uh, culture, right? So, so with, with this text, I, I am, with this piece that I will deliver, I, I started, it reflects some kind of thoughts on um, what, what you might call the, the, kind of, the kind of culturalization of political economy, which is something that you can see kind of happening in parallel as the state withdraws as a, as a, as a, as a, as a mode of, of, of protection and and, and, and caretaking um, um, in in for, for our for really for our, the, our basic needs in our lives uh, uh, in the world our, our way of being in the world um, I mean this is the, the, by culturalization I'm I'm really thinking about um, I'm really thinking about uh, the, the the rise of new forms of of, of nationalisms and, and and consciousness of 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 of, of our ethnicities, our histories, uh, our enemies, uh, and and the kind of rise of of uh, the, the resurgence or, or or the sudden discovery of historical uh, cultural grievances, right? Cultural grievances: who hurt us in the past? Who killed uh, my family and my people in the past? Right? So so this is a, another kind of this is a, a, a very dangerous terrain for thinking about also new communities as they come together, right? So it's another kind of catastrophic um, uh, uh, side to, to, uh, to the neoliberal world, to, to uh, kind of on in parallel with financialization, 
but I don't want to think, uh, and I'm trying very hard not to think in a catastrophic mode about these things, but I find for myself that the only way of doing so is to be a bit slow, right, and a bit careful. And, 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 and so I, I wish I could also be as, 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 as bold and forward thinking. I, I, I can leave that to EXA and, and sort of frame this talk as a, as a, a kind of very long-winded uh, question posed, posed to EXA and perhaps uh, as a, we can do a kind of collective uh, Q&A and discuss these, uh, these issues together. Um, the story begins, uh, the story begins in the US with the, <laughs> the Martian, right? So I mean, I think also one of the maybe side benefits of, of, of this, of, of, of this re return, this resurgence of culture, you know, of, of a cultural understanding of ourselves is also, we don't, we, we don't really have to mince words anymore in identifying the enemy. And I think many of the tools, whether, you know, uh, many of the tools that we are talking about do, do come out of the kind of, you know, the kind of military economic hegemon of, of the US. So it's for a, a kind of lighter example for those, many of you who saw The Martian, right? And, this, and there's this hilarious uh, quote at the end that really is a kind of an ideological, uh, kind of ideological statement made by the, the character, played by Matt Damon, Mark Watney, right? Uh, who, is, who, is, who is abandoned uh, on Mars and has to find his way home. Uh, and he says, at some point, everything's gonna go south on you. Everything's going to go south. And you're going to say, this is it. This is how I end. Now you can either accept that, or you can get to work. That's all it is. You just begin. You do the math. You solve one problem, and you solve the next one, and then the next. And if you solve enough problems, you get to come home. All right, questions? Right? So this is the very last line of the film, and I think it really gives you the, it's, it's really a, a, a quite ideological kind of American engineer, uh, engineering kind of, kind of get her done you know, statement. You do the math, and you get to come home. These triumphal closing lines of Ridley Scott's 2015 film, The Martian, are delivered to a class of university students eager to hear the story of the man who survived and was rescued from Mars. Of course, The Martian is not a true story, but the film is a, is a peculiar parallel to Steven Spielberg's 1998 Saving Private Ryan about a handful of US troops who penetrate enemy lines to rescue a lone soldier during World War II. Against all odds, a vast national military or space agency is placed in the service of saving a single life. And the true story is probably the story of Hollywood narrating the fatherly care of the state. But whereas Saving Private Ryan summons blood and sweat to penetrate enemy lines against all odds, in the case of the Martian, the care and custodianship of a single human life must use science against an inhospitable universe. They must summon math to struggle against the vastness of space and time before their externalities, duration, lifespan, food supply, Martian climate, close around what a single human life can endure. The enemy lines of the Martian are these externalities, and the means of penetrating through them comes not through military struggle, but intellectually, through mathematical modeling. When you solve enough problems, you get to come home. Today, the trillion-fold increase in processing power experienced over the second half of the 20th century and into the 21st is slowing down. Yet the ways of using and exploiting, or inhabiting, this enormous power are still being explored. The power to communicate, to organize the transportation of goods and people across distances, to register and synchronize changes in value as they enter and exit various zones, have radically expanded the way that space and time are expressed and perceived. <coughs> Yet these extensions are only possible through the medium of alphanumeric or mathematical calculations which move through space and time with an ease that objects or human bodies cannot match. As Donna Haraway once wrote, our best machines are made of sunshine. They are all light and clean because they are nothing but signals, electromagnetic waves, a section of a spectrum. And these machines are eminently portable 
Oh, thank you. Mobile, a matter of immense human pain in Detroit and Singapore. People are nowhere near so fluid, being both material and opaque. While objects and human bodies are distressed or damaged by the pressures of movement, numbers always arrive at their destination, just as they were at their origin. A five stays a five anywhere in the world, just as it was a five 3,000 years ago. However, it becomes important to note that when mathematical vectors are used for modeling, they are not able to plot space in the same way as time. Henri Bergson is known for insisting on the primacy of lived duration in experiencing time. As we have said, quote, as we have said, when one wishes to prepare a glass of sugared water, one is obliged to wait until the sugar melts. The necessity for waiting is a significant fact. It shows that if one can cut out from the universe the systems for which time is only an abstraction, a relation, a number, the universe itself becomes something different. If we could grasp it in its entirety, inorganic but interwoven with organic beings, we should see it ceaselessly taking on forms as new, as original, as unforeseeable as our states of consciousness." Unquote. Time is extremely difficult to model through mathematical abstractions whose absolute vectors cannot account for changes that occur. Space, on the other hand, can be assumed as being more absolute, stable, and linear. Bergson adds that when we evoke time, it is space which answers our call. Sometimes we mistake one for the other. For our understanding of temporal change often suffers from having the properties of space prematurely projected onto it. This can be quite easily imagined through the utility of Google Maps, whose coordinates are usually accurate. One's destination rarely changes position in the course of traveling towards it. In modeling time, however, it is tempting to consider Bergson's foundational principle in relation to the market crash of 2007-2008, when immense computational power aided US banks in speculating on the value of assets that had become so profoundly abstracted from their real-world application that they detached from even their own values. Right? We had a question about that earlier. Many of these assets were created from collateralized insurance and debt packages, essentially instruments for protecting against contingencies of non-payment or accounting for changes in market values spread over time. And it is paradoxical that if for Bergson lived experience is what truly measures time, thousands of people were abstracted from the very base of their lived experience, their homes. It is against this backdrop that much of the, the artist duo Golden Cenobi's work is situated. And so in 2016, they were invited to present part of a larger retrospective show in the library of the Stockholm School of Economics. Among the works that faculty and students of the school found themselves confronted with was Zero Magic, a magic box containing computer software called Zero Magic, a US patent application for a computer-assisted magic trick executed in the financial markets. That's that's what it was called. And four historical examples of magic tricks played out not as a performance on a stage, but in the world at large. Though apparently made of cardboard, the magic box could resemble the black box of computer hardware, a server performing calculations unavailable to the human eye due to their complexity, speed, the secretive nature of magic, or for all of these reasons. The, the patented magic trick Golden Cenobi developed together with the magician Malin Nielsen and finance sociologist Theo Borgeron was originally sourced from a secretive hedge fund in the US and designed to use short selling tactics to undermine the perceived value of a publicly traded com uh, company and to then extract a profit from the difference. Of course, it is extremely likely that the original tool sourced from the US hedge fund uh, performed a similar task. Displayed on a plinth, the cardboard magic box would be unremarkable were not surrounded by a five-sided abacus, a cage sealing in the secretive magic while outwardly performing elementary calculations for all to see. It is indeed a portrait of the two faces of computing, hidden magic, 
trickery, or even powers, and the user interface simple enough for a child to engage with. As a computer, Golden Centipede's Zero Magic poses a crucial question concerning how it can be possible to reconcile the universal availability and clarity of numerical calculation with the deep and perhaps equally universal mysteries and mystical properties also ascribed to numbers, right? Which becomes even more complex when we think about cryptography. And I will deal with, with the numbers a bit later on. Many people were astounded by the fact that the catastrophe of the market crash of 2007, 2008 did not bring about significant changes in the financial world. <coughs> New regulatory measures were introduced and toxic tendencies were acknowledged. But now, a decade on, it would appear that the general consensus was that the problem had to be understood as a glitch in a much larger, fully functional economic system, or at least one whose power had not yet been exhausted. Right? And we know, you know Milton Friedman, who was who, you know, from, the Chicago, from Chicago school, right? who was a you know, great pioneer and architect of, of, of neoliberalism, he was an advisor to, to, to Ronald Reagan. He was, at, this, at the same time as he was actually running the, the, the Fed, he was also talking about how it should be abolished. And it was perhaps naive at the time to foresee the end of capitalism when we all know capitalism is constantly ending through the endless production of catastrophes, when in fact it was most likely an important stress test marking a new era of computational abstraction for it has now become clear that the models used for projecting changes in value over time produce feedback, creating numerical values detached from the real-world commodities they were created to account for. How, then, are we to understand this peculiar weaponization of number? Numbers are by definition abstract, and even in ancient times were considered to hold incredible power, even as a regulating force for the universe itself. We might begin by asking, how could such a strictly formal world of numerical calculation have unleashed the capacity for creating seemingly unlimited, self-contained worlds? How does the modeling of such worlds invite or restrict habitation by non-numbers such as humans? Eventually, we may be able to ask, do these worlds access or perhaps even amplify even ancient cosmological approaches to numbers and numerology as universal forms regulating and reflecting the chaos of the cosmos. I mean, this could be even a promising proposal. God forbid. <coughs> On June 14th, 2012, only two years before becoming the charismatic Minister of Finance in Greece with Syriza's January 2015 election victory, Yanis Varoufakis wrote a blog post detailing how he became involved as an economist in residence with a well-known gaming company called Valve, and, uh, I think around Seattle in the US. It all began with a strange email, as Varoufakis details in his initial blog post for the company. The post describes how he was contacted unexpectedly by the president of Valve, named Gabe Newell, who candidly described that the company was working to wrestle with some of the thornier problems of balance of payments in linking economies in two virtual environments, creating a shared currency." Unquote. It struck Newell that he should contact Varoufakis directly when it occurred to him. This is Germany and Greece. So he was basically trying to synchronize real-world real money with gaming, with gaming money, right? With the point system in gaming. Varoufakis took the job almost immediately, describing the remarkable and wonderful young people and working environment at Valve, but also the, the economist's paradise of being able to experiment meaningfully <laughs> in an economic setting whose information set was total. A virtual gaming environment is by definition made of pure metrics. Every interaction is accounted for. For Varoufakis, this would allow an escape from the computerized astrology nightmare of, of econometrics, whose statistical reliance on, imperial, uh, on <laughs> empirical regularities lacking any causal meaning identified patterns of behavior without knowledge of real-world factors that might explain them. 
For instance, in the case where Christmas is explained by a prior increase in the demand for toys. <laughs> right? So the event coming before the, before the, 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 the event coming after the, the numbers. It would, it would appear that in such an economist's paradise, there would be neither Christmas nor toys, or that Christmas would appear as a calculable demand, rather than a fuzzy human intention, before the demand for toys would begin. The end of Varoufakis' brief time at Valve is no doubt part of history, yet his own documentation of his beginning remains curious. Were these two virtual environments described in Gabe Newell, what, what were these two virtual environments described in Gabe Newell's initial email? Supposedly, Valve was experimenting with, with in-game currencies, circulating in a secondary market that could synchronize with real-world currency inputs. Such syn synthetic economies have been under development since the early 2000s, when games such as World of Warcraft and environments such as Second Life successfully experimented with exchanging real money for virtual goods. Research into these secondary markets have identified them also as black markets or, or gray markets hosting extreme in income inequalities in their own right by pegging the value reaped to either time spent in the game or to the amount of initial investment. And they are, initially cr and they are certainly incredibly fascinating in their own right. No? I think similar to what you were saying earlier about uh, having either you know, $8,000 $8, when, you, when you play Monopoly or starting with, with $100. But what is, what is even more fascinating is the Valve President's apparently poetic and even radical comparison of the two virtual economic environments of game currency with the all too real economies of Germany and Greece. For Gabe Newell, it appeared that Germany and Greece were already inside of such a gaming environment. With Greece's debt crisis triggered in 2009 following the global financial crisis of 2007-2008 and its subsequent bailouts by the International Monetary Fund and the European Central Bank, it had already become clear that the country was in dire straits. As the EU's largest economy, Germany, had assumed its present position as the EU's debtor. What does Varoufakis' ready acceptance of the poetic equivocation of the virtuality of these two economies mean for us? Does he intend to say that game space is merely a paradise for an economist, or rather, or, or, in, or also, that game space is actually the real world of the economy itself? If indeed the debts between nations are better understood as synthetic currencies, then undoubtedly the programming and architecture of the game become more important than the value of the currency, for the former can only make the latter possible. Seen this way, money becomes code, pure algorithmic and numerical calculation. What then is the architecture of the game? If the map has indeed become the territory, how do we understand the peculiar terrain of the map itself? While Baudrillard's theories of, of simulacra are clearly relevant today, it is interesting to note that the recurring primacy of the real in relation to the virtual in his writing, even if the real has been utterly evacuated and people are doomed to becoming commodities, the real <coughs> still kind of persists as this ancestral home to which we are barred access, right? We're always sort of trying to get home like, like uh, Matt Damon, you know, to the real, to the kind of hobbit, hobbit house of the real. No, where we can have a little chimney and you know, smoke a pipe. And where Baudrillard and even De Boer before him faced the dread of simulations treating people as commodities on a market, today it is more accurate for people to fear becoming numbers in a game. Where commodities appeal to subjective and affective domains of desire, numbers carry a much stronger and more direct claim to an empirical and scientific domain. The architecture and construction of this domain thus becomes the game as well as the place where subjective desires and even deliberate misunderstandings are installed. In an interesting way, the claim that numbers are dehumanizing can only be ridiculous, for numbers are by definition inhuman and absolute points used to measure relations. Games, on the other hand, establish the playing field where those relations then become a life world. 
and that's one inhabited by humans. A number will not subtract life or humanity from a person, but will only measure the amount subtracted by another human within the game. The great reliance of economic, social, and political activity on, on computational means has rendered those means an intractable part of the activities themselves. High-frequency trading is accompanied by the risk of world financial meltdown. Social network-driven uprisings have opened new roads to authoritarian regimes or worse. And access to information creates a, a reverse opening to spying and harassment, while online news mixes with fake news and bot armies paid by state agencies to troll and spread opinion. Right? We know all of this. The feminist data scientist Kathy O'Neill has remarked, Quote, thanks to the extraordinary powers that I loved so much, math was able to combine with technology to multiply the chaos and misfortune, adding efi efficiency and scale to numbers that I now recognized as flawed. Right? This is from, from Kathy O'Neill's brilliantly titled book, Weapons of Math Destruction. As democratic processes now become number games of exit polls and campaign fundraising, Voters themselves vote against their, their own economic or social interests simply to undermine technocracy, to opt out of the game itself. Supposedly, abolishing technocratic gameplay would herald a return to the primacy of the real, no, to the Hobbit house. But when numbers represent absolute values, where else could the real possibly be found? What if we were to instead seek out the real within the fabric of simulation? in the material or formal aspects of gameplay itself. No? And I suggest that you keep this in mind also when you, when you consider the, 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 the proposals of, of the Economic Space Agency. In gamer theory, Mackenzie Work suggests that the game might not be a utopia, but it might be the only thing left with which to play against game space. Earlier in the book, he writes, you do not play the game to win, or not just to win. You trifle with it, playing with style to understand the game as form. You trifle with the game to understand the nature of game space as a world, as the world." Unquote. In Alex Galloway's Gaming, he describes gameplay as an operational correlative to Roland Barthes foundational postmodern distinction between the text and the work, whereby the text can be attributed to an author, but a work can be reshaped and filled by readers' subjectivities. The architecture of a game thus functions as a script, but the play of a game can refashion that script by grappling with its inner logic, by negotiating with it. And he writes, play constitutes the field, not to create a new wholeness, but to enforce a sort of permanent state of non-wholeness or non-totalization." The intricacies of these encounters suppose diegetic actions occurring within the script's narrative, as well as non-diegetic actions arriving from, from a meta-domain of the user or the hardware of the console. These meta-behaviors can range from cheating, under undermining the rules of the game, to pausing the game, which Galloway writes, can be as significant as shooting a weapon, basically hitting pause button on the world. Right? <laughs> That's a weapon. Game space quickly becomes less a metaphor than a concrete reality when considering the degree to which managing personal finances already overlaps with gameplay. In most games, a player's remaining life or number of points gained is measured and displayed as a finite amount. A player is always mindful of this figure, as if noting the amount of money available in one's own bank account. What would happen if we were to assume that the bank account, the bank account to be the specific measure of life remaining in the game? A larger game space, of course, but game space nonetheless. Though we know wealth can never reflect a person's true value, from the perspective of game space, it can also be said to reflect the amount of life or power remaining in worlds that recognize its currency. This is the larger game space work describes in gamer theory, the game space of computational cap capitalism, and perhaps, by extension, the fluid power relations that emerge from the contingencies released by it. On the one hand, it should offer some relief 
to remember that a game is always just a game, nothing more than a model and a form of hypothetical play. At the same time, as the rules and architecture of this game grow further entangled with life-sustaining processes, it also becomes a game that no one can afford to lose. In many parts of the world now, digital wallets are replacing cash as well as credit cards. In China, WeChat and Alipay have made credit card payments almost obsolete. Nearly all street vendors, landlords, and even some beggars now accept digital payments. In the US, Apple Pay is becoming common as a standard, but at a slower rate than in China. The advantage of digital wallets is not only in the convenience of waving one's phone at a point of sale to buy a coffee or split a dinner check. On a higher level, for economists, for instance, they promise the phasing out of liquid currency and the full integration and registration of all payment activity within a single framework. It begins to look precisely like the economist's paradise of a total data set that Varoufakis described in the case of Valve's online gaming engine, where all transactions are recorded and subject to analysis, from the level of the individual up to that of society. Just as it offers a clear picture of an individual's movements to serve the purposes of surveillance or of their buying habits for effectively targeted product placement, it offers an economist, or government official for that matter, an unparalleled image of real economic activity in incredibly high resolution. A game is always just a game. And surely there is more to a person than what's in their bank account and what they buy on Amazon. When combined with one's browsing history and, pr and private exchanges, a human or machine can assemble a quite detailed picture. Philosopher Matteo Pasquinelli has pointed out that for all their faults and biases, pattern recognition algorithms have, with vast computational power and ever larger data sets at their disposal, they have become so powerful that they now identify real patterns that were previously undetectable by humans themselves. Which is to say that I could learn things about myself and my own history or family history that I myself had not been aware of before. It is important to note that once their results attain the status of real knowledge, their empirical value is often too strong for what they revealed to become unknown, no? to, to, un to unlearn what you, what you, just, what you just learned. Right? This situation vastly supersedes Orwellian Big Brother surveillance, state paranoia, as we remember from earlier eras of, of kind of moralist or militarist police state control, for non-ideological economic management must first and foremost embed itself in existing life processes in order to maintain command. Given the enlarging of, ga of game space to the scale of a life world, we might also ask who this game space answers to. Who is its architect and who must it obey? Put another way, if gameplay and life processes can indeed be so seamlessly interchangeable, could it be that they in fact share, some, share more than we previously thought? Could it be that the border between real world and game worlds is little more than a sacred boundary between, between a kind of the, what we understand as, 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 as the profane or, or the sacred, established to, pr to protect the moral order of the psyche. Were that boundary to be removed, we might, you know, I don't know, like, like, Le like Neo in the Matrix, blossom into a kind of full realization of our own powers and capacities in perceiving the world as an absolutely programmable meta-platform, right, at the end of the Matrix. Or, Perhaps we would instead end up closer to the figure that we, this kind of figure that we sometimes read about, no, of the, the, the gamer in China who wears a diaper, to avoid leaving the game, even to use the bathroom. On the one hand, a kind of brutal, uh, brutal uh, expression of slavery uh, as a prisoner to the game. But on the other hand, we have to, we have to admit a god ruling over many, many worlds, right? And what kind of god takes bathroom breaks? None that I know, <laughs> right? So if we, if we are to kind of fold, if we're, so this produces a very, very strange kind of new power relation, right? If we accept that, that when we check our bank account, we are already functioning inside of a game world, then we, can, we, we also have, to, also, we have to, to understand this kind of very strange new political uh, paradigm of the, of the gamer. 
Furthermore, I can't help but think that this is how both winners and losers at financial and institutional games often appear in the art world, where works are sold for, for arbitrary financial values and exhibited at large, in, at large museums for ambiguous cultural values, or in academia, where credits are traded and spent, even, where even senior members of the, of the game in academia will, will, will sort of play the politics of the institution, right? So suddenly, in retrospect, we realize how close game, game, game worlds, quantified game worlds, uh, have been to us actually the whole time. And it's in this particular space of, of where institutional life has already been consolidated and synchronized numerically, and some would say even financially, that I think the work of, of the Economic Space Agency is, is where most of its possibilities are. So, to, to, to conclude, what happens when game space not only describes the virtual worlds created by capitalism or computer modeling, but the actual functioning of the universe itself? For those who prefer the platonic cave allegory, found endlessly in films such as The Matrix or The Truman Show, the encounter with the real is created by a painful liberation from, from the creature comforts of false consciousness, right? But even in Plato's cave, the slaves who have been liberated from their enslavement to illusion exit the cave to encounter a world with few characteristics beyond the light of the sun. The domain of the real in Plato's allegory is in fact so abstract that one wonders how real such a space can actually be in relation to the cave. Right? Because really, the, the only description of the, of the outside to the cave is, is that is, it's really sunny, right? Considering your uh, introductory comments, no, it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, we are sitting in a, in a pretty dark cave uh, now. And indeed, seen today, Plato's description of the cave resembles precisely the architecture of a cinema. The question remains whether it comes as a relief or a horror to leave the myopia of game space only to be faced with a universe that looks uncannily similar and even operates according to similar rules. No, I mean, it's, most of you are probably familiar with the, the architecture of the cave where there is a, where there is a fire and there, are, and there are slaves who are shackled and watching for their entire lives, who are watching the, the fire project uh, on, onto shapes and create shadows on the wall. So they're essentially watching these movies made by, made by shapes projected by the light of the fire. And, the, and for Plato, the job of anyone who finds their way out of the cave you know, is, to, is to go back and liberate, the, liberate the, the, the slaves from the cinema. Right, basically a projection room. Alfred North Whitehead described Western philosophy as a series of extended footnotes to Plato. But before Plato, Greek philosophy was engaged in a far more mystical investigation into the laws of the universe, informed by Egyptian, Chaldean, Phoenician, Arabic, Jewish, and Persian traditions. For Pythagoras, who greatly influenced Plato, and who was known for having developed the theorem for the right angle triangle and the Western system of musical notation, numbers offered direct access to the source code of the universe. But before Plato and Aristotle began to develop the terms for distilling a scientific viewpoint, Pythagoras' interest in number was an ecstatic one. He is known for playing enchanting music on the monochord and for having the ability to communicate with animals. There's even a story of how he tamed a wild stallion by whispering into its ear after it had previously killed those who tried to tame it through more conventional means. For Pythagoras, Numbers were a crucial means through which the universe gives form and ethics to matter that would otherwise flow infinitely. It would just be stuff. And it is the logical systems derived from numbers that reveal what we might call God's programming language. To build with this language is to create music and philosophy, as well as communication with other forms of creation, animals, matter, and the cosmos itself. In West African drumming, the different metrics of rhythm are often said to create tension through suspending a state of permanent contradiction. It can, be, it can also be called syncopation, cross rhythm, technically, or you, know, you might also call it funk, right? Funky music. 
It happens on the level of timing, or a sophisticated metric that expands and contracts, falling in and out of alignment through overlapping patterns based in twos and threes. Consider how difficult it is, how much strength is required to persist in playing your own meter within and against an ensemble playing in another time. You have to force your way forward knowing that what you are doing is correct when you are also completely off the grid, operating by your own grid, folding it into their grid and falling back off of it again. This is not Western music whose orchestra looks like some kind of parliament assembly, reading from scripts and following the direction of a conductor. Another example of how the world could be programmable, which I only learned recently, actually this is really interesting. So Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, the 17th and 18th century universal philosopher credited with the discovery of binary code, as well as integral calculus and the encyclopedia, right, first learned of the, of, of the I Ching, from, uh, from a Jesuit missionary friend in China. The I Ching is an ancient Chinese text whose origins are often described in the, in the same mythical terms as the origin of humanity. And it is structured as a game for, div for divining many possible fortunes using basically binary code. Zero and one correspond with Tao, roughly translated as the way, and qi, which is, material which is roughly translated as, as material energy. Male and female, presence and absence, on and off, form and matter. Right? These are not moral parameters, but a kind of source code of the universe that allows for more complex combinations of things to come into being. If the ethos of globalization has been that it is only through money that we can connect to one another and to the cosmos, we might find some reassurance in realizing that it, is not only through, that it is only through computation that we can even connect to money in the first place. Or put differently, it is only through number. Perhaps connecting to one another and to the universe through number is not an altogether absurd idea if we are to take the, the numerical fundamentalism of the I Ching and its binary code as our point of departure. From medieval guilds to today's contemporary art fairs, artists have always served power, or they have always sought, to, or, or they have sought to avoid power completely. However, this comes as a matter of immense human pain in places where art students and, and young artists have learned to be, to be anonymous, sovereign, or even bohemian agents of free creativity. The state, through funding bodies such as the Art Council, the, uh, the, the father who provides the stipend, the gallery, or through the market, the artist, uh, is it through the artist's own obstinacy and grit, or is it through God, through the moral principle of autonomy as a human entitlement and social consensus on what constitutes pious behavior? Rather than approach this question as a zero-sum game, no matter, and which direction we, no matter which direction we turn, in some, you, you could say that we must sell our soul, but perhaps we should look instead for ways of, of accessing the source code through which power itself becomes fluid and diffuse for the points at which we can neutralize and diffuse the question entirely, where no one actually really owns anything. Michel Foucault has been criticized for having taken, uh, for having taken considerable interest in the 1970s uh, American neoliberals of the Chicago School, Milton Friedman, Gary Becker, and the others, who were essentially the architects of the neoliberal economic theories adopted by Reagan and Thatcher in the 1980s to dismantle social services, and which, became, and which has become a norm through mo throughout most of the world today. It is interesting to revisit what he says in his lectures on biopolitics from 1978 and 79. And he, and he says, the American neoliberals try to use the market economy and the typical analyses of the market economy to, de to decipher non-market relationships and phenomena which are not strictly and specifically economic, but what we call social phenomena. What I think is at stake in this kind of analysis is the problem of the inversion of the relationships of the social to the economic. On the one side, it means generalizing the enterprise form within the social body or social fabric. It means taking this social fabric and arranging things so that it can be broken down, subdivided, and reduced, not according to the grain of individuals, but according to the grain of enterprises. The individual's life must be lodged 
not within a framework of a big enterprise like the firm, if it comes to it, <coughs> the state, but within the framework of a multiplicity of diverse enterprises connected up to and entangled with each other. Enterprises which are in some way ready to hand for the individual, sufficiently limited in their scale for the individual's actions, decisions and choices to have meaningful and perceptible effects, and numerous enough for him not to be dependent on one alone. And finally, the individual's life itself, with his relationships to his private property, for example, with his family, household, insurance, and retirement, must make him into a, cert a sort of permanent and multiple enterprise." Unquote. Reading this today, it would appear that what he calls the grain of permanent and multiple enterprises is no longer small business or even currency, but has been subdivided further into smaller grains, clicks, views, and hits. If we were to continue the process of reduction, to break the grain down to ones and zeros, would we end up with such a fundamental and basic substance shared with many other domains of life that we could essentially build back up to whatever we want? Thank you. <laughs>